Chapel International presents the Overcomers Convention 2019 theme, Seven for Significant Impact. Ministering at OC 2019 are Reverend Dr. Isaac Quay, Bread of Life Christian Center, Bishop Gideon Titi Ofe, Pleasant Place Church, Reverend Dr. Michael Boedin Yamiche, the Maker's House Chapel International, and Prophet Prince from Pong, Kingdom Praise Ministries USA. It's from Wednesday 27 November to Sunday 1st December 2019, 6pm from Wednesday to Saturday. Saturday and 9 a.m. on Sunday at the Tehila Temple Harvest Chapel International, South Tesano. Morning sessions on Friday, 29th and Saturday, 30th November with Dr. David Eldon Schroeder from the Pillar College, USA. Spread the word and don't come alone. Your host is Reverend Fitzgerald Odonko. Music by Harvest Gospel Choir and others. Thank you, Bishop Adonkor, for that very warm welcome and uh, the wonderful reception we had from the moment we stepped into Ghana at the airport and were met and uh, helped to come all the way through here. And uh, so good to be here again. I've already uh, demonstrated I feel at home because I took my coat off already. So uh, thank you so much again. I send you greetings, especially from my wife, Betsy, who was with me last year, but for family reasons did not come this time, but also the two pastors who were with me last year, Pastor Frankie uh, and Pastor uh, Amor, they are, are doing other ministries right now, uh, but they send love and greetings and they're jealous that I'm here and not, not them. So, uh, so glad to be here and uh, to have the opportunity of sharing with you uh, some important teaching. I, I want to uh, help you understand that there are two kinds of teachings that can go on. There's teachings for information and teaching for inspiration. Now it's ideal when those come together, but this is gonna be heavy on the information side, which I hope will then turn into inspiration, but I know you're going to get a lot of inspiration also from the other preachers, including uh, our dear friend, Prophet Prince. So uh, this will be some serious study. And uh, I want to introduce to you some ideas I've been working with for over 40 years and have been teaching material to groups uh, like this uh, in many places. And uh, so far, it's been well received. So uh, I'm calling it now concerning the spiritual because those are the first words um, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 that start out a section that is often considered uh, the section on spiritual gifts. I think that's possibly not really what it's about, and you're going to find out why. And I also call this finding your charisma, because charisma is the Greek word for gift. It's one of the Greek words for gift. But um, I think, let me see, make sure I'm able to use this properly. There we go. Have you ever wondered why? If the church unity was such a big deal to Jesus, a big deal to Jesus, and if he sent the Holy Spirit to empower the church with spiritual gifts and to guide us into all truth, have you ever, ever wondered why is there so much disunity in the church and controversy over spiritual gifts. And why do so few believers walk in spiritual victory and power and fruitfulness? I'm not sure where you are on the theological spectrum. There are some people who are, uh, believe that the gifts died with the last apostles and there are no more spiritual gifts and that we have the Bible now so we don't need the spiritual gifts. Well, does that mean we don't need the Holy Spirit either? Then there are some other people at the other end of the spectrum who are, um, are so in, involved with the spiritual gifts that they for, almost forget about Jesus, the giver of the gifts. And it be, can become a, an area of great controversy, and it shouldn't be. But churches have split over this issue. And I think it's because of wrong teaching. And I think it's specifically because of some wrong translation that I'll show you in a moment. 
I'm hoping to cover in our sessions these three areas, understanding spiritual gifts and discovering my spiritual gift and using my spiritual gift. So we'll spend this morning's session on understanding spiritual gifts. So some preliminary ideas. Every Christian has a spiritual gift. When you receive salvation, you receive the Holy Spirit. You receive all of the Holy Spirit you'll ever get, but he hasn't received all of you. <laughs> As you yield more and more of yourself to him, you empty out of self and you fill more and more with the Holy Spirit. So you have the Holy Spirit. If you're a believer in Christ, when you're spiritually born, you receive the Holy Spirit. At some point in your walk with the Lord, maybe you realize there's a lot more than just salvation. There's the whole area of, of being baptized in the Holy Spirit and filled with the Holy Spirit and, and sanctification and being anointed with the Holy Spirit. There's so much more. And you as pastors know that. You want to see your people growing in their spiritual maturity. But every Christian has a spiritual gift. And it's important for you to know your gift. It's not essential for salvation. We will probably meet people in heaven who didn't even know about spiritual gifts, perhaps. But it's important. Otherwise, it wouldn't be in the Word of God. And joy comes as we exercise our gift. Now, this is a very important idea. The word for gift is charisma. The, the word for grace is charis. But the root of both of those words is the word car, which is the word for joy. C-H-A-R, we would spell it in English, car. And joy is not happiness. Joy is the deep-seated conviction that my life is in harmony with the will and purposes of God. That's what joy is. The deep-seated conviction that my life is in harmony with the will and purposes of God. And that's why I can have joy in any circumstance. If I know I'm rightly aligned with God, I have J-O-Y. <laughs> Jesus, others, and you is how I learned it when I was in Sunday school. J-O-Y. So, but it's, another reason it's important is because one of the ways that you will discover your spiritual gift is when you get in touch with what gives you the most joy in ministry. And that will give you a hint about your spiritual gift. A couple other spiritual, uh, preliminary ideas. I think. There we go. Your natural abilities may be sanctified or set apart by God as your spiritual gift. Now, a charisma is not an ability. It is not even an activity. A charisma is your deep-seated motivation. It's what drives you. It's, it's your orientation. It's not an ability or an activity. Now, you are involved in ministry, and the Lord may, let's say you're involved in teaching, and maybe that is your spiritual gift, but maybe not. Personally, I don't think the best teachers are the ones with the gift of teaching. I'll explain that later. So your natural ability may be set apart for God as your spiritual gift, but not necessarily. Here's an important idea. God designed each gift to edify the church. It's not about you. It's not a gift for you to keep. It's a gift for you, your orientation, to be used to bless the church. That's what it's for, to bless the church. And so, therefore, God wants you to know and to use your spiritual gift. So, how did the confusion begin? It began in 1611 when the King James translators inserted the word gifts into the texts of 1 Corinthians 12.1, 13.2, and 14.1. Now, I'm not against the King James translation. Don't misunderstand. They were more honorable than a lot of the modern translations. Because if you look at it, if you have a King James translation or a New American Standard Bible, which is the one I use most often, the word gifts is in italics. Look at it if you have it. 1 Corinthians 12, 1, 13, 2, and 14, 1, the word gifts is in italics. What does that mean? It means that the translators acknowledge that it's not there in Greek. It's not in the Greek language. 
It, Paul didn't write in 1 Corinthians 12, 1, now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers. He said, now concerning spiritual, the word pneumatica. We get the word pneuma is the Greek word for spirit. And he's saying, now concerning the spiritual, I don't want you to be ignorant. Okay, so what happened when you put the word gifts in, then you believe that everything in the chapter of 14 and 13, of, of 12, 13, and 14, everything there is about spiritual gifts. It's not. Those chapters are primarily about manifestations of the Spirit, which are different from spiritual gifts. But when we put the word gifts there, you assume all of this is about spiritual gifts, and so there are all a huge number of spiritual gifts. Now, let me ask a question. How many of you have ever taken a spiritual gifts inventory? Have you ever done that? They haven't, oh, well, that's good. Blessed are you that you haven't. <laughs> so sometimes you take these gifts inventories and they have a list of like 28 gifts. And you go through and say, okay, I'm good at this, I'm good at that, I'm good at hospitality maybe, I'm good at evangelism, I'm good at whatever. But those things are not listed as spiritual gifts. And, those, and, and usually you end up with three, four, or five spiritual gifts. And how are you going to concentrate fully, as Paul says, on three, four, or five gifts? You can't do it. I have enough time, hard time just dealing with the one gift I have. So I'm going to show you, I think, in Scripture that you have one spiritual gift. And it's the way you're wired it's your orientation, it's your motivation, it's deep inside your soul. You are always, even if you don't understand it, you're always coming from that frame of reference. And as you get to know people, you begin to see how they're oriented differently than you in ministry. And all the gifts working together are beautiful. So this is what this says. Now concerning spiritual matters or spiritual things, the pneumatica, I do not want you to be ignorant. Are you with me so far? Okay. All right. So there was a mistranslation. Now, if you go to that, that chapter, 1 Corinthians 12, he starts out, now concerning spiritual matters or spiritual things, I do not want you to be unaware or ignorant. The, the word unaware or ignorant is the word agnosis. <laughs> we get agnostic from that. I don't want you to be not without knowledge about spiritual matters. And then in verses 4 to 6, he said, there are distributions of gifts, and there is the word charisma there. And there are distributions of ministries or services. And there are distributions of effects. Three different kinds of, of spiritual pneumatica. There are gifts, charismata. There are ministries, diakonia. We get our word deacon from that, serving ministers. And then there are effects, and that's the word energemata. We get our word energy from that. Those are three different things. They're all spiritual matters, but they differ from one another. And we're going to see how that happens. So I want you to, um, this isn't a Greek class, but I want you to understand another fact here. So charisma is uh, the Greek word that we're focusing on and that we'll see here under spiritual gifts. It's a grace thing, literally. Charis is grace. A charisma is a grace thing. A divine gift given without merit of the receiver. Now, in English, we, we use the word gift to translate three or four different Greek words, but they have different meanings in Greek. It doesn't come out in the English because it's always the word gift. Other words are doma, a thing that is given. That's one word in, in Ephesians 4, 8. Another is dosis, which God confers on someone. It's James 1, 17. And then another is a doria, a gratuity. You can find that one in Acts 2, 38. And doran, a present, possibly something expected. Those are not spiritual gifts. But because they're translated gift in English, it can be confusing. For example, the first one, Doma, is the passage in Ephesians 4 that said, when Christ ascended on high, he gave gifts to men. Those weren't spiritual gifts. Actually, the men, the people, are the gifts. He gave some as apostles, and some as prophets, and some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers. That's Doma. He's given those. Now, each one of those, of course, 
has a charisma. And it doesn't matter what role you are in in the church, you can have any one of the, the, the uh, what I call charismatic gifts. And there are seven only that we're going to look at. But I want to just see the Greek word for gift can be confusing. So here's what really what we see in uh, 1 Corinthians 12. Spiritual things, the pneumatica, and under them, three areas. Gifts that are given, and they're listed in Romans chapter 12, verses 6 to 8. It's the only place in Scripture where spiritual gifts are listed. Romans 12, 6 to 8. That's where we'll spend most of our time. Then there are ministries, which are ways that you can use your spiritual gift. And we can seek ministries. And one of the great things about knowing your spiritual gift is that you can seek um, ministries that are really compatible with your gift. I don't know if you've been like me, but sometimes I've been asked to do things and it's kind of like way outside my zone. Really just not me. I was so glad with that beautiful singer, songstress. What was your name? Kappa? I was glad that they weren't calling on me to do the singing. It's just not my gift. Sometimes you find yourself, though, outside your zone. Outside, and you're, you're doing it because somebody asked you to or somebody needed to, be, it needed to be done, but it's just not you, and you don't have a lot of joy in it. In fact, it's probably pretty exhausting when you're outside of your gift. Well, but you can seek ministries. And we have some ministries, not all of the ministries are mentioned in Scripture, but some are. And then there are manifestations, which we are to exercise and receive the manifestations, and we'll look at some of them. That's what 1 Corinthians 12 and 14 are all about. And, and the manifestations are things that you exercise and you receive when the Holy Spirit distributes them individually. And it's not permanent. Your spiritual gift is permanent. It's part of, it's your spiritual DNA. It's how you're wired spiritually. But manifestations occur as needed and as distributed by the Holy Spirit. You can't make it up. You can't, you can't uh, conjure it up yourself. A, a manifestation is something the Holy Spirit does. So this is how this works together. So what are these? The spiritual gift is a motivation. It's the inner motivation which God places in each Christian to express his love to the church. Please understand this. It's not an activity. It's not an achievement. It's not a ministry as such. It's the way you're, you're wired. Let me use an illustration for anybody who has any tech savvy, and I don't, but I understand this much. Your spiritual gift is like your hard drive. It's, it's built into the computer. You get it when you buy the computer. <laughs> you get your spiritual gift when you're born again. But on your hard drive are many different possible software, different kinds of applications that you can use. You can choose them. I can choose um, WordPerfect, or I can choose PowerPoint, or I can choose Waze. I can choose... Those, like you can choose a ministry. And then the manifestation is how you use that. So if I've chosen Word, then I can type up a document. And that becomes, in a sense, my manifestation. I'll give you other illustrations that maybe are more suitable for some of you later. So a gift is an inner motivation. Now there are seven. And they're listed in Romans 12, 6, 8. The only place where Paul lists charismata. And there are seven. Prophesying. Prophesying is primarily proclaiming truth. We're going to look into these a lot more de in detail. We're going to drill down several times. Serving is meeting practical needs. Some people are just wired that way. Teaching is clarifying truth. It differs from prophecy, and we'll explain that later. Exhorting is building up the faith of others. It's encouraging others. It's the same word that um, Jesus used, at least in the Greek, of the Holy Spirit, who is the, um, uh, the counselor, the comforter. He's the paraclete. Parakaleo is the Greek word for the exhorter. 
Then there are people with a spiritual gift of giving. These are people who entrust assets for ministry. They like, they're great stewards. They like to see things um, resourced so ministry can go forward. I was telling somebody yesterday with regard to our college, you know, we depend upon tuition and donations. And we do a lot better with the tuition than we do with the donations. And, and I said to him, sometimes what I say to people is, we're not in it for the money, but without the money, we're not in it. It takes, takes resources to do ministry, right? So some people, we're all supposed to give. The fact that giving isn't your spiritual gift doesn't let you off the hook. But some people love to do it, and they are great in stewardship. Managing is, is the sixth gift listed, and it really means coordinating the efforts of other people, bringing other people together, sort of like a project manager, to try to achieve big goals and to fulfill a vision. And then the seventh one, and not the least by any means, is empathizing or mercy. And it means sharing and removing emotional distress. Now what I'm submitting to you, I believe based on God's word, and I think I'll demonstrate this, not that you have one of these, you are one of these. You are a prophet, or you are a server, or you are a teacher, or you are an exhorter, or you are a giver or you are a manager, or you are an empathizer. That's how you are wired. And it's so wonderful when you discover that. It just clarifies so many things. I've seen this work. I've seen it rebuild marriages like my own parents. I've seen this bring a wholeness to a church. I've seen this salvage a church. I'll tell you that story a little later. And it just really helps you when you understand one another better. So those are the seven, and you are one of those. So some of you are thinking, well, wait a minute. You have to really prove the idea that there's only one spiritual gift per person. But let me say this. I've taught this material to thousands of people over the last several decades, and I always make this offer. If you can find in Scripture a place that either states or even implies that one believer has more than one spiritual gift, please come and bring it to me. I'll stop teaching, and I'll take my book, Walking in Your Anointing, off of the market, and I will be humiliated. <laughs> but nobody's ever, there's always one verse that somebody comes, yeah, but what about this one? And that's when Paul says to the Corinthians toward the end of chapter 12, seek the greater gifts. But he's not talking to an individual He's talking to the whole church because the church was dysfunctional. If you understand 1 Corinthians, that was what I call an adolescent church. I love that church. A lot of energy, a lot of vitality, a lot of diversity, but a lot of problems too. And that's what Paul was responding to. And some of the problems had to do with the wrong use of the manifestations. And so after talking about the manifestations, he's saying, but seek the greater gifts as a church, but especially prophecy because they were exalting speaking in tongues even more than prophesying. And Paul said, I'd rather just give five words of prophecy that you, everybody understands than thousands of words that they don't understand. So scripture consistently reports that each Christian has only one spiritual gift. Could I get some water here, please? Um, gifts are compared to members of a body in Romans 12.1. Okay, you see that, you probably know that analogy. And they're compared to members of the body. This would be a poor analogy if one person could be many or even two organs of the body. You are a member of the body. You're not an ear and an eye. You're not a foot and a hand. You're one member of the body. And that's the analogy that he uses. Now that would be a very poor analogy if, if, that were, um, if you had more than one spiritual gift. Another point. Thank you. The structure of Romans 12, which is where the list is, and the purpose of Romans, unlike that of 1 Corinthians, indicates that its list is complete and not partial. Let me unpack that a little bit for you. So, who was the founder of the church at Corinth? Anybody know? The Apostle Paul. 
He said, you have many ministers, but you only have one father. He started that church. He pastored there for 18 months. And they, they didn't meet just on Sundays. <laughs> they, they met consistently. And he had an opportunity to teach them all, all that the Lord had taught him. His full gospel. And I'm sure he taught them about the spiritual gifts. So the issue of gifts isn't a problem to them. They already know about that. They're having a difficult time managing the manifestations of the Spirit. Who started the church at Rome? If your answer is anything other than Jesus, you're wrong. Because we don't know. Paul hadn't even been there yet when he wrote to them. He said, I'm wanting to come to you. And I want to use you as my next base because I want to take the gospel even to Spain. And so to get your support, we don't know if we ever made it there. I don't think he did because he didn't know Spanish, right? So, uh, but we don't know if he ever made it there. That was supposed to be a joke, okay? So he, he didn't know. Anyhow, he didn't, make, he didn't make it there so far as we know. But that was his intention. He wanted to keep pushing the gospel farther and farther. And so what is the purpose of Romans? To tell the people his full theology. Chapter 1, starting with the doctrine of sin, and, the, and, and what mankind is like, and the need for salvation. Chapter uh, 3 and 4, justification by faith, and going on, talking about where does the law fit in, and talking about the Holy Spirit, and talking about all of these things. And then he gets to chapter 12, and he says, um, I beseech you, brothers, by the mercies of God, that you present yourselves living sacrifice unto God, which is your reasonable service. Holy, spotless. And then he says, and don't think of yourselves more highly than you ought to. <laughs> and now I'm going to show you that there, the church has many members. It's one body, many members. And here are, and then he teaches them the seven. This is where he lists it. He, te he lists it because they haven't taught them yet. And this is his basic teaching for them. A couple more points about only one spiritual gift. Each believer is to concentrate fully on the gift God has given him. And this would not be possible if he had more than one motivational gift. You can't concentrate on two things at the same time. You might say, well, I'm a multitasker. I got lots of screens open. But guess what? You only got one brain, and you can only use it for one thing at a time. You might have other screens open and other things that you're trying to do. But you can't concentrate fully on more than one thing at one time. And so... Paul says, concentrate fully on your gift. Like I said earlier, I'm glad I don't have more than one. It's difficult enough concentrating fully on one spiritual gift. First Peter, it's nice to know, Peter and Paul agree on this idea because they both received inspiration from the same Holy Spirit. First Peter separates gifts into speaking and serving gifts. And all of the seven can be separated that way. Obviously, prophecy and uh, teaching and exhorting, helps to take the lid off, prophecy serving, uh, prophecy, teaching, exhorting, and possibly mercy are speaking gifts. Serving and um, giving and managing and possibly mercy are, are serving gifts. So Peter separates them into speaking and serving gifts and he doesn't list them, but he says in 1 Peter 4, 10 and 11, each one should use whatever spiritual gift he has received. The noun for gift is singular. He doesn't say use your spiritual gifts. Use whatever spiritual gift you have received. Paul instructed Timothy to not neglect the spiritual gift within you. In another place, he says, stir up the spiritual gift within you, assuming only one gift. Now, if you remember who Timothy was, he was very talented. Paul trusted him more than anybody else. He became the bishop of the church at Ephesus. The entire province of Asia, which is western Turkey, was evangelized through that ministry of Paul and Timothy and the, the school that was there at, at Ephesus, I think maybe the first Bible college. Timothy was very gifted from a human point of view, but he had only one spiritual gift. And Paul said, stir it up, stir it up. Don't neglect your spiritual gift. And then in Romans 12, 3 again, having only one motivational gift helps keep us more dependent on each other and Christ 
and keeps us properly humble. Humble. And, of course, that's a wonderful attribute that we're to have. So, I, I, again, I would offer to you the same thing. If you believe you found a place that says that a believer, one believer, has more than one charisma, please come and show it to me. I, I don't think you'll find it, but I'm well willing to listen. So here's how this works. As I exercise my motivational gift through a ministry or a calling, the Holy Spirit determines what manifestations will benefit the receiver or me the most. So here's an illustration. I think it might be in your notes. An, an empathizer or a person with the gift of mercy has a teaching ministry about unity in the body of Christ. Okay, So this is a person whose spiritual gift is mercy. And she or he is teaching. Teaching isn't the person's spiritual gift. It's a ministry. They might teach you an adult class about unity or a Bible study about unity. They're teaching. And from that teaching ministry can come many different kinds of manifestations. These are the nine that are listed in um, 1 Corinthians 12. Manifestations of the Spirit, word of, no word of wisdom, word of knowledge, faith, healing, effective miracles, prophecy, discerning spirits, various tongues, and interpretation. These are all manifestations. These are not spiritual gifts. They're not. They're not listed as spiritual gifts. And therefore, they're not permanently bestowed and that you have on call. These are distributed by the Holy Spirit as he chooses to whomever, whenever. Well, this is, I know this is different from what a lot of people in churches teach, but I'm trying to be biblical here and understanding these are not spiritual gifts. They are manifestations. The confusion goes back to what we said before, the misinterpretation or the insertion of the word gifts by translators early on. So in this particular case, this, the, the, the empathizer, the woman who's teaching or a man who's teaching about, about unity, the effects of that teaching on the people will differ per individual. Some may receive from it a word of wisdom of understanding what unity is. Some may receive a word of knowledge of understanding why we don't have unity in our church because brother so-and-so and brother so-and-so are at odds with each other and they won't forgive each other. And the only way that that person who received that message knew about it is because the Holy Spirit downloaded it on them. That's a gift of, uh, that, that's a manifestation of a word of knowledge. I'm not going to go through all nine of them here, but these are all ways that the Holy Spirit can manifest for the glory of Jesus the teaching about unity in the body of Christ from a person who's an empathizer. Let me see if I can move to another illustration. This is an illustration where a server is doing worship leading. Now, worship leading is not listed as a ministry. It is a ministry. It's a wonderful ministry. And different worship leaders coming out of their different spiritual gifts are going to do it differently. Let me give you an example of a church that, that uh, Prince and I know about in New Jersey. They, they had a worship leader in, in the past who uh, was very talented. Uh, he was the worship pastor for Michael W. Smith. I don't know if you know that name. He's a very famous Christian music, uh, artist. And this guy was the worship pastor for him. And then he came as the worship pastor for a church close to us. And when he first learned this teaching about spiritual gifts, it lit him up. He said, now I understand. I do it so differently from other people. When he, te when he um, is leading worship, he's teaching people. He's teaching about why this song was written and who wrote it and what it says. And he's unpacking the theology of these songs because he found out his spiritual gift is teaching. But he's a worship leader in ministry. Alternating with him occasionally was another worship leader who um, teaching was not his spiritual gift. He was a good worship leader. But he almost didn't care whether anybody else was out there. He, he, was, he was alone with God. He took you straight vertical. I mean, when he led worship, you just got sucked up into it. He didn't care whether you did or not, but he was going to worship God and you were going to go with him. And it was just a different orientation 
from their different spiritual gift, but they both had the same ministry. Now, in this case, this person is a worship leader, and other manifestations that are, uh, we see uh, not listed, we, but we see examples of them in the book of Acts um, are possible other manifestations that occur as a, the worship leading is going on. Now, all of these, what is there? Is there another nine or ten? These are places in the book of Acts where it says that a group or an individual, a small group, they were, something happened and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. That phrase is common to all of these. They were filled with the Holy Spirit and they were bold and they exalted God and they were filled with faith and there was healing and they spoke the word of God and they prophesied and they did binding and they were filled with joy and they had a revelation of Jesus. These are manifestations that occurred in the book of Acts and they can occur today too as the Holy Spirit chooses them. And I believe this. If you're spirit-filled, and I'm sure most of you, if not all of you are, these things are going on in your life and you just haven't labeled them. You know, oh, you know, that's prophesying. Or, oh, that's exalting God. Or, oh, that's filled with faith. You're having manifestations. You just haven't labeled them. And you don't need to. God's going to do them anyhow. But it's different from a spiritual gift. So I hope you understand. Gifts, ministries, manifestations okay so what's our responsibilities for all of this to concentrate on our gift that's what we're told to do Romans 12 6 to 8 to seek after the best ministries oops I went ahead sorry well, I'll get there concentrate on our gifts to seek after the best ministries I guess I won't I'm trying to go backwards and, and to expect God to distribute the manifestations as he chooses. So our responsibility is to understand our gift, seek the best ministries, and trust the Lord to give the manifestations. Now, let's look. We're going to drill down lightly into the seven gifts, and then we're going to take a break. And then uh, come back and we'll go more deeply. So this isn't the whole thing on these. So this is prophecy. Prophecy is to proclaim truth. Its basic meaning is to foretell or to preach. To declare God's truth. Prophets have a great concern for righteousness. You remember the words by the Old Testament prophets. Thus says the Lord. Because they're motivated to proclaim God's word. They, they, want, they, set up a, they have a high standard for godliness and righteousness. And they expect people to, to confront to conform in obedience to God's word. In both the Old Testament and the New Testament, prophets also can do foretelling, pre predictive foretelling, but that's not their main function. Their main function is foretelling, to proclaim truth. Now, if you're a prophet, you have that so deep in you, you probably already know about that. This is not one of the difficult gifts to, to um, discover. But I have found this. A lot of people glom onto this one right away. Oh yeah, I'm all about the church. I'm about truth. I'm about proclamation. But it's not a lot of people who really are prophets in terms of their motivation. Prophecy, you see, is also a ministry. And it can be a manifestation. This is the one that crosses all the three. I'm not a prophet. by That's not my spiritual gift. But sometimes when I preach, not all the time, I preach prophetically. I get in your face. <laughs> you see, here's the difference. A prophet is somebody who challenges your will and wants you to repent. Now. <laughs> a teacher is somebody who challenges your mind. They want you to understand, and they're gonna be a little bit more patient with your growth. That's the major difference there. Sometimes those are confused. Okay, so that's a prophecy, proclaiming truth. Serving is to meet practical needs. It has the same root word as deacon or servant. It means to meet the practical needs of others. These are hands-on people. These are can-do people. These are folks who see what needs to be done and they want to do it. And they think they can. And they probably can. The server just goes about in the situation fixing things, doing things that are necessary that other people don't even see or think about. And they get joy. They get great joy out of doing these practical things. And frankly... The church can't do without them. And my guess is in your church, you probably have more people with this gift than any other gift. And if so, blessed are you. Because they, they're the fuel that keep the church running, the servers. 
And then there are people who have the gift of teaching. There aren't a lot of them. And James says there shouldn't be many. These are people whose primary uh, orientation is to clarify truth. They clarify truth through research. They like digging in and digging deep. The word of God is proclaimed through preaching and explained through teaching. The teacher is motivated to verify truth and to clarify it to others. They just as soon do research as actual speaking. They like discovering truth. And, and uh, they do it orderly. Exhorting, this is a wonderful gift. Parakaleo, I mentioned the word means to come alongside. It's the gift of building the faith of others through encouragement. These are encouragers. Whenever you're with an exhorter, you go away feeling encouraged if they're walking in their anointing. Whenever you're with an encourager, you go away usually with some ideas about how to be a better Christian because they have a wonderful plan for your life. <laughs> they love you and they have a wonderful plan for your life and they will help you understand how can I grow? These are good disciple makers. They're motivated to come alongside help and comfort and challenge. Sometimes they comfort, but sometimes they challenge. The exhorter is a counselor who gives practical suggestions about how to solve problems. Quite a few probably have that gift here. Many exhorters become pastors. They're usually very good pastors. Givers means to entrust assets, the motivation to share and to invest. It's, it's something we, we all share, but these are people who are very keen on stewardship. They entrust personal assets to others for the furtherance of their ministry. And it's not all just about money. It's other resources. Um, um, facility resources. Personnel resources. They know how best to use resources to bless the church. It carries the idea of simplicity and generosity. These are not complex people. They are very motivated to resource the church. And their, concentrate, their concern is that their gifts should cause others to grow. Now, there aren't a lot of people like this. I think every church board is blessed if it has a giver. Not just because of what they can give, but because of the guidance they can give in, in financial management. Managing. The Ministry of Coordinating Efforts. Now, this is the most difficult one of the Greek words to really define. It, sometimes it can mean to lead or to preside or to organize or to administrate. But I think the word manage is the best word because it has to do with bringing people together to perform projects. They're not really people people like exhorters might be or mercy people might be. They're sort of project people, but they're not just project people like maybe um, servers are. They bring together these two ideas. And, and it's a motivation to coordinate activities to achieve the common good. These are people who have big picture. They have vision. And they see what has to be done and that they can't do it themselves. If they were a server, they'd try to do it by themselves. But as a manager, they want to get other people involved and use those resources as people. And so... This person clarifies the objectives and they move the group toward a common goal. It may not be the leader. Sometimes it is. We'll drill into that more later as well. The last of the ones listed, and by every means, please understand, this is not a weak gift. It's to meet emotional needs. These are some of the boldest, bravest people in the church. Now, it's not my gift. But the people who is, here's how I differentiate. When I see somebody crying or really needy and broken down, I'm uncomfortable. And if I weren't a pastor, I'd want to run. <laughs> it's not my orientation to kind of hug on people and wipe their tears and so on. I should do that. But usually before I get to, somebody beats me and there's somebody with the gift of mercy because they're not thinking about themselves, they're thinking about the other person. It's a powerful gift. It's the one thing Jesus said, be like your heavenly father. He is merciful. Well, not of us have that spiritual gift, but it means to show compassion and mercy, to feel sympathy with the misery of others and to desire to bring comfort and to have pity. It means to get on an emotional level with them. And I hope by now we understand that having emotions is not weak. We have this whole thing now called EQI, emotional intelligence. And it's a very important part of leadership. But these are people who naturally have this EQI component. Counseling she needed at that time, but that might be what a prophet would say. The server would say, do you have anyone to help with the funeral arrangements? 
trying to meet the practical needs, right? The teacher might say, well, I have a really good book on the grief process, trying to help her understand what she's going through a little bit better. The exhorter might say, well, God will use this to deepen your message. And that's probably true. Whether that's what that person needed at the moment, we don't know. The um, giver might say, did Harry have adequate life insurance? <laughs> Concerned about her financial resources. The manager might say, I've got the deaconesses bringing meals, organizing and leading and providing. And then the empathizer might say, tell me how you're feeling. So you can see how we're motivated differently and how, you know, you might not discover your gift by looking at that necessarily, but those are possible ways of responding. Another illustration is um, a situation where a youth pastor crashes the church van, okay? And the prophet would say, so you were on church business, I assume, okay? The server might say, well, don't take it to the garage. I can fix it. And the teacher might say, well, there was a much better route to take, you know. And the exhorter might say, well, I hope you'll use this to caution the teenagers. And the giver might say, the church youth budget will cover this. And the manager might say, I'll get six parents to drive the kids to life, a conference. And the empathizer might say, was anyone hurt? <laughs> so you can see how, again, one situation could result in different kinds of responses depending on a person's motivation. Okay, so what about ministries and manifestations? Now, um, we're going to drill more deeply into each of the gifts and we're still under the passage, the section, understanding your spiritual gift. So what about ministries and manifestations? Let's talk about them quickly. Um, so ministries are the avenues of service in which a Christian ex exercises his or her spiritual gift. And so that we don't feel that we're, we're left off the hook with any of these, we're admonished to do all of these as ministries, all of the seven spiritual gifts. It may not be your motivational gift, but you're still, uh, all of us can prophesy. We can all proclaim truth, even though that might not be our gift. All of us are supposed to serve each other, Galatians 5.13. We can all do some teaching as a ministry, Colossians 3.10. We're all to exhort one another, Hebrews 3.13. We're all to be givers or to give, 2 Corinthians 9.7. We all are to manage our, our lives and, and help in the church, 1 Corinthians 14, 40. And we're all to show mercy or empathize, Colossians 3, 12. So some of the people have said to me, well, if I just have one gift, then that exempts me from all these other things. No, it doesn't. <laughs> you do those things as ministries, but you're gonna do it through your spiritual gift. So what about ministries and callings? And again, these are things that we can seek. We're not gonna spend a lot of time here. I'm not sure if this is in the notes or not. I didn't look that thoroughly. Uh, I hope so. If so, you can look at, if just write down these texts if you don't have that. Ministries and callings are things you can seek. 1 Corinthians 12, 27 to 31 lists some ministries and callings there. It starts out with callings, apostles and prophets and teachers, workers of miracles, and then it moves more into ministries, gifts of healing, helps, administrations, and kinds of tongues. And then... Um, let me pause there because some people point out, well, it says gifts of healing. Is that the word charisma? Yes, it is. So is healing a spiritual gift? It's not listed by Paul in, first, in Romans 12. And here's why the word gifts of healing is used. So all of these other things are always basically spiritual in a way. Workers of miracles. You can't go to some doctor and say, okay, do a miracle for me. I mean, maybe if he's a, a godly, Christ-centered person, he prays for a miracle and he'll be healed. But secular people would go to secular doctors and get healed. Remember the woman who had the issue of blood? She said, I went for 12 years, I've gone to doctors and spent all my money and they didn't help me. But, but uh, so again, again, charisma is a grace thing. This is a kind of healing. So this is really talking about divine healing, divine healing is a ministry which the Lord will do, and he can do it through any person 
who is spirit-filled regardless of your spiritual gift. It doesn't always happen on call and on demand, but it is a ministry. So then these are other areas of ministries, helps and administrations and kinds of tongues. Our ministries and manifestations you're going to see in a moment. But Ephesians 4, 11 lists apostles, prophets, evangelists, and pastors and teachers. These are not charismata. These are um, people gifts, people who are gifts to the church and overseers, bishops, episcopoi, overseer is mentioned in 1 Timothy 3, and deacons and elders. These are um, callings that you can seek. Paul says to Timothy, it's, if a person desires to be an elder, it's a good thing. They should need to be qualified. There are qualifications there. But it's not wrong to seek a ministry. Manifestations are the possible activities of the Holy Spirit in the lives of those giving or receiving ministry. Now, please understand this. Only the Holy Spirit can do the manifestations. We can fabricate them. We can imitate them. And some people do. And of course, that's wrongly motivated. They're trying to draw attention to whom? To themselves. The manifestations are to draw attention to Jesus. That's what the manifestations are for. And, but it's what the Holy Spirit does. And those that are listed in 1 Corinthians 12, 8 to 10, we talked about earlier. Word of wisdom, word of knowledge, gifts of healing, kinds of tongues, faith, interpretation, discernment of spirits, prophecy, effect of miracles. So I have a, I've written a book called uh, Walking in Your Anointing where I look into all of these nine and talk, give some illustrations about how I've seen these different manifestations in people's lives. They're all legitimate, but they're legitimate when the Holy Spirit brings it about, not simply because I want to have it happen. So um, I list these questions here for a response just for you to think about. Have you been turned off to the spiritual gifts because of confusion with manifestations? Many people have. They don't want anything to do with it. It causes dissension and conflict and, and misunderstanding in the church. So let's just put it aside. Well, that weakens the church. Are you eager to know more of the Spirit's power through your gifting? I hope you are. I hope the people in your church will be. So we're going to move on to discovering my spiritual gift, okay? So I'm going quickly here because this teaching usually takes seven or eight hours, and I don't have that kind of time here. So, so maybe I'll um, leave out a couple stories or something. But any questions at all yet about understanding spiritual gifts? If you have a question, feel free to raise it because I'm sure it's been asked before, probably. So are you all... You're with me. You're understanding. You have a question. Okay, gifts. Yeah, so that's what I was talking about before. Why, is, why do we have gifts of healing there? Yeah, and then the working of healing and then working of miracles. Working of miracles. So those are ministries that the believer can have and you know and uh they're, they're not a gift i mean if if miracles was a gift then somebody around here who had that could every time they wanted to do a miracle they could do a miracle but even paul peter s said you know when they asked him about uh the man who has been healed he said if you think that i did this you're crazy this only was, goes to jesus jesus did this jesus is the miracle worker Okay, now he'll do it through a believer as a ministry. So, so it is a ministry. It's not a spiritual gift. It's not, it's not how you're wired. You may want to do this, and at times the Lord may use you to do this, and he's used me to, to bring about miracles, but only when I give credit to him. I don't, want, I, I don't ever, ever, ever want to do a miracle or be involved in healing if somebody's going to give me the credit, because that's dangerous. Don't ever touch the Lord's glory, right? But if God chooses to do it, and I'll tell you this too, when somebody comes for healing, this is my own deal, I don't automatically jump into praying for healing, because I don't know it's God's will. If it was God's will to heal every Christian every time they ask for healing, none of us would ever die. But sometimes it's not God's will, as it wasn't for Paul. He said, I'm giving you grace instead of healing, more grace and more grace. 
and Paul exalted, glorified in that. Another question. Yeah, thank you, Doc. Uh, I see under the manifestations, um, healing as a manifestation. Yes. I want to find out whether it's a manifestation or it's a gift. It's not a gift. It's a ministry done by a person, but it's a manifestation in the person receiving the healing. All right. But okay. I see in the first Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9, talking about uh, gifts of yes. healing. Yes, that's what, what I was saying before. The word gifts there is to distinguish it from secular healing, from a healing that a, a doctor gets involved in. When it's a charisma, when it's a, it's a gift from God, it's a divine healing. So that's really what that's about. This is a divine healing. I don't know if that's helpful to you, but I think there's a distinction there. Okay? I like this, by the way. I <laughs> some teachers here, maybe. You also notice that when you're talking about healing, it talks about the gifts of healing. Uh -huh. You know, um, in different places. First, you have gift of healing. Yep. Then you have gifts, sorry, gifts of healing. Then we have gifts of healings. And that's what I want to understand. Gifts of healing, yeah, that's what I was just talking about. He's talking about impartations of healing from a divine perspective, a divine healing, not a, not a healing that's a secular, a doctor's healing. It's a distinctive, it's a, a spiritual healing as opposed to, like, if, like I have, uh, let's say I have high blood pressure. <laughs> I go to a doctor, he gives me some medication and, and my blood pressure goes down. Is that a divine healing? Well, in the sense that God gives humans the ability to do medicines, but it's not like if God just instantly changed my blood pressure without any medication. So it's a distinction there. My concern is more on the gifts of healing, not, why is it not gift of healing, but gifts of healing? Yeah. That's, that's my concern. Right. Charismata are the divine, it's talking about an impartation it's a gift from God to the person. It isn't a, a spiritual gift that I have as a motivation. It's a gift to the person. I've been healed. That was, I've had a manifestation of healing several times, actually. And that was a gift to me. But it's not a spiritual gift that I have, that, I can, that I'm motivated to. The only place where those are listed is Romans chapter 12. So you think about it more and dig into it more. Okay, good, I, I, enjoy, I enjoy the dialogue because if one person has a question, probably several other people do as well. Okay, so, oh, there's another question. Yeah, I would like to find out if there is a, a distinction between ministries and callings or they are the same. I didn't, done between? A calling and a ministry, okay, very good. So, callings are usually referred to offices in the church. You know, apostles, prophets, who's called as an apostle, not somebody, not somebody the gift of, but they're, they're positioned in the church as an evangelist or a pastor, you know, or, or a teacher in the church. That's a calling. It can be a spiritual gift, but it's a position in the church. Ministries are avenues of service that any believer can do, and we can seek those. It's, it's a little bit different. I just put them together because both of them were allowed to seek you can seek a calling. You can seek a ministry. Okay, good question. Okay. This is um, a challenge against what we have known for a very long time. I'm talking about a gift here seen as manifestations rather than gifts uh -huh. with all the books with okay let me limit it to myself all the books i have read have always seen these ones you know the nine ones we've lifted here as the gifts of uh -huh. the holy spirit mm -hmm. now your teaching challenges that position and you cite the greek background to be a, the source of error if it is you know, my challenge, my question is that apart from what we are being taught now, is there, I don't know, maybe some reference that we can consult for further, you know, study on this? Because I think it's something we want to chew on for some time. 
you because it challenges the status quo, yeah. you know. And for me, I want to do some justice to this feather. Is there any material or source that you've, you've come across that solidifies your position? Interestingly, some older Bible scholars and commentaries make these distinctions. A lot of the new ones, because they use newer translations of the Bible where they don't even put the words in italics, they just kind of assume these are all gifts. If you look at verse 8, or verse 7, 1 Corinthians 12, 7, it says, now the manifestations of the Spirit are. Okay, so it's very clear. He's talking now about manifestations. He's not talking about spiritual gifts. Manifestations of the Spirit are. And then he talks about the nine that are there. But yes, some of the older commentaries and scholars that I've researched make the distinction. But a lot of the new ones, they will just use a newer translation that doesn't go into the Greek at all. They don't, they don't understand what Paul was really saying or teaching. They're, they're just kind of going from their own theology. They, they read their theology into what the text says rather than digging it out of the text and knowing the Greek and knowing how to, how to discern between these ideas. So our orientation is that some of these are gifts. Now, are you trying to say that everybody has one gift mm -hmm. and that is our DNA? Yes. That's who you are. Every believer. Every believer has a DNA mm -hmm. as an empathizer or a prophet mm -hmm. or a server mm -hmm. or a manager. Now, when we talk about healing, it's not a gift, but it's a manifestation as a result of something. Mm -hmm. Is that what you're saying? Yes, or it can be a ministry that, that a person is doing, regardless of their gift. They can be ministering healing from the Lord, and, but it is a manifestation. It's listed as a manifestation. Because like you said, we have this orientation that this is a gift given to us. Yeah. Okay, so we walk around saying, okay. that I have the gift of healing. But you are saying that we don't have the gift of healing. We have the manifestation. Yes. And the, the gift healing. comes from the Lord. So if, if, it was a, if, if healing was a spiritual gift, then everybody you prayed for would be healed. But I don't know if you've had 100% success, but I haven't. <laughs> and so that's why I usually pray first for discernment. What is the Lord saying to me about that person? Okay. Those are good questions. Pastor. Let me get it clear. Um, you're saying that the gifts of healing, I, I see it here as a manifestation. But are you saying that it's also a ministry? It, it's, it is, okay, it's, when, if I'm called upon to pray for healing for somebody, mm -hmm. okay, that's a ministry I'm being called upon to do. If you receive the healing, it's a manifestation of, of Jesus to you to give you divine healing. You see how that works? It's a ministry that a person can have. It's not their spiritual gift because it's not a on call. It's not. It's not how they're hardwired. I understand that. Okay, it's, but it's if it can be a ministry of healing, mm -hmm. but the person being healed, it's a manifestation. It's in. It's happens to them. Okay. 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 Any other? It's a good question. Thank you. And again, if one person has it, probably many people do. All right. Let's, let's drill into these spiritual gifts a little bit more. But, and this you're going to need to mention to your people if you decide to do this teaching. There are hindrances through discovering your gift, unresolved problems in personal living, a damaged relationship, not forgiving somebody, for example, or an improper perspective on yourself. Oh, I'm just nobody. I don't have this. Yes, you do have a spiritual gift. If you have the spirit of God, you have a spiritual gift. It's been built into you. Or maybe an inadequate response to God. Maybe you haven't really surrendered and you're not filled with the Holy Spirit, you're not sanct in the being sanctified, an inadequate response to God. These are hindrances that can stop you from receiving the knowledge of your gift. Lack of involvement with the needs of others. I had this happen in a terrible way. I was with a group of guys at a teaching similar to this when we were learning about 
our spiritual gifts and we were all kind of figuring it out who we were and what we were. And this one guy just said, I cannot, I, I have no idea. And the problem was none of the rest of us could figure it out either. Why? He wasn't involved with people. It was a miracle almost that he even came with us because he was a loner. He isolated himself. He never did discover his spiritual gift. And I don't even know if he was a believer, but he was in our youth group. And eventually he, he committed suicide. I don't think it had any relationship to the fact that he did discover his gift, but he was just so detached from everybody. You have to be involved because, again, the gifts are given to bless the church. Lack of involvement with the needs of others. If a person's a loner, they're not going to know their gift because they aren't going to be able to use it. Confusion between the gifts and the various ministries in, in which they are exercised. And this is where it happens a lot. You can't discover your gift if you've got it lumped up with a whole lot of other things in Scripture that aren't gifts. And failure to understand why we appreciate certain activities. Now, I can appreciate... Um, somebody else's gift when I see it in them, but I don't see it in me. And so I should still appreciate it in that person, but I could hear some other hindrances. Attempts to imitate the ministries of others. So um, I can't imitate Prince's ministry. I can't be him. I love him. I admire him. I trust him in the Lord, but I'm not Prince and he's not me. But if I want so much to be like somebody, and I did this. My, my first mentor had the gift of mercy. He was a great pastor. And he loved people, and people loved him. And he was very relational. I admired him so much, I wanted to have that gift. It's not my gift. <laughs> Just ask my wife. <laughs> but you can, you can get overly enamored with somebody and want to be just like them and think, oh, that's got to be my gift. It might not be. Unwillingness to accept the gift that God has given you. Some people say, oh, I don't want that gift. Well, God wants you to have it because he gave it to you. So thank God for it. And then exercise it and grow in it. And you will want it. You'll appreciate it. Or not understanding the characteristics of the seven gifts, which we're going to look at later. These are some hindrances to discovering your gift. Practical steps. Oops, i go back one. Practical steps. Discover, develop spiritual integrity. Make sure you're right with God that there's nothing between you and the Lord, that you're spiritually clean. Examine yourself realistically as the spiritual gifts are presented. Eliminate the gifts that are obviously not yours. You'll be able to eliminate four of them instantly, I suspect, quite likely. Narrow the list down to a choice between two gifts if you can. You probably will. And then identify specific instances of ministry or spiritual involvement with others and ask yourself, here's the key, why? Why were you doing what you were doing and what effect did you want to see achieved? The question why gives you your motivation. These are motivational gifts. They're how you oriented and what are you trying to see accomplished? A couple other practical steps. If you had the ability to assist others in exercising one of the gifts as an activity, which would you choose? Okay, so you probably know what your gift is or, or, or think you know what it is and so um, you might find that out because what you are motivated to help other people do. Givers like to help other people give, for example. It may not be their gift, the other person's gift, but they want to encourage them that way. Understand your desires. How would you answer this question? If you were free to do whatever you wanted in serving the Lord with no social stigma in the church, <laughs> no financial limitations or other urgencies pressing you, what would you do? If you had complete freedom, in the church, to do what you want, what would you do? Then in the light of the two undecided gifts, if that's where you are, ask yourself, why? Why would you want to do that? What would be driving me from the inside? Is it to encourage somebody else in their growth? Is it to give resources? Is, is it to manage other people? Is it to um, meet the practical needs? Is it to declare God's truth? Is it to empathize and share mercy? Or is it, is it to, you know, um, to serve? What is driving me? And then commit yourself to action. If you're still undecided, choose the one that you think is the most likely and concentrate on that one gift. I had a friend who, um, who wasn't sure whether his gift was serving or giving. So he said, okay, I think I'm going to try giving. <laughs> so, so for the next several weeks, um, 
he, that's what his mode was, to try to be a giver. And he finally came back and he said, well, I gave all my money to the Lord, and he took it. <laughs> so that wasn't his gift. He had no joy in it. He, he was a server, as a matter of fact. Okay. So here are the characteristics of the prophet. Drive to express his message verbally. Very compelled to speak. They're prophets. They proclaim. They have an ability to discern the character and motives of people. They're not perfect in this way, but they have spiritual antenna. And they pretty much can sense the motives of people. And they're quick to identify, define, and hate evil. They, they proclaim righteousness. They're willing to suffer brokenness in order to prompt brokenness in other people. You see, that's where, in, in calling people to repent, that's, that's their main word, repent. Think of John the Baptist, repent. And the other prophets, repent means to change your mind. And to do that, you've got to be a broken person. You've got to be humble. If you think you've got it all together, you don't think you need to repent, you're not going to be a broken person. The prophet's willing to suffer brokenness in his own life or her own life to prompt brokenness. They depend on the scriptural truth to validate their authority. Thus says the Lord. They don't speak out of their own authority. They speak out of the truth of God's word. And they have a desire for outward response to demonstrate in, inward conviction. Prophets have no trouble asking people to come to the front to declare a decision that they're making to come publicly, to come boldly, to confess it. They want to see an outward response to an inward conviction. They have a directness and frankness and persuasiveness in speaking. They don't hedge words. They might be an extrovert, they might be an introvert. By the way, that's not related to your gift. A person can be an extrovert or introvert with any of these seven gifts. But Prophets are very direct, they're very frank, they're persuasive. They have a concern for the reputation and the program of God. They're so wounded when some failure, moral or financial or, or some other organizational failure, tarnishes the reputation of the church. The prophet is broken over that. They have an eagerness to have others discover their blind spots. We all have blind spots. Prophets are quite glad to point them out, <laughs> but they'd rather we discover it ourselves. They have an inward weeping and anguish over the sins of those they talk with. They're not glad to find sin, but when they do, they want to call it out. But they, they weep over it. They're saddened. And they tend to see things in black and white. They're not people who uh, see any grays. Everything is either good or bad, right or wrong, righteous or evil, black and white. And some people, that's their orientation. So those are the characteristics. But because you have a spiritual gift doesn't mean you're mature spiritually. And so there are misuses of spiritual gifts. And then there are also misunderstandings. I don't know if we'll get to them, but we're going to look at the... Because a lot of times people discover their spiritual gift by seeing themselves in the misuses. <laughs> so sometimes they correct people who are not their responsibility. Sometimes they jump to conclusions about words and actions and motives. They think they're being discerning, but they're really being deceived. <laughs> they think that they've figured it out, and in their lack of maturity, they're wrong. So they, so they need to come before God humbly to seek his discernment. They, reinforce, they can reinforce a condemning spirit. They can get a group to be focused so much on sin, they're not focused on salvation. That's in their immaturity. Okay. They, they can have the tendency to judge and expose rather than to restore an offender. A lot of them really love that Matthew 18 place. Well, let's just kick them out of the church. Well, the idea of Matthew 18 isn't to excommunicate. It's primarily to restore them. Okay. So, and then they can cut off a person who has failed. They, they may not have the patience and the forgiveness to work with a person. This again in the in the lack of maturity, um, other uh, misuses. I'm not getting it up here myself. Okay, wait, went the wrong way.
Okay, mine isn't going here. Hang on. Okay, there we go. Dwelling on the negative rather than the positive can be a misuse. Lacking caution and tact in expressing opinions. Now, prophets are never going to be overly concerned about being tactful. They could care less about political correctness. They want kingdom correctness. Amen to that? Okay, glad we're there. Prophets, though, can be overly um, acerbic uh, and can be overly critical and, and not try to build a relationship. They can just be too direct at times rather than first understanding. They can demand a positive response to a harsh rebuke. And that's not always going to happen. Sometimes it will. You know, I remember one of the pastors I worked with who had three little boys, and they were a handful. They weren't always obedient. Can you believe that? And so one time he um, brought a little bit of punishment to one of his boys. Uh, you know, they, he, he said he applied the Board of Education to the seat of learning, if you know what that means. Um, he spanked him. And uh, the boy was crying. And, and the crying bothered him, so the father grabbed him by the arm and said, now be happy. You know? And sometimes we kind of want that approach. You know, We give a harsh re rebuke and we expect, oh, everybody's going to be real happy with that. Not necessarily. Uh, condemning themselves when they fail. I mean, prophets can sin. And boy, the enemy wants to attack them. The enemy wants to bring them down because they declare truth. And when they fail, they're their worst critics. And they may never get back on their feet again unless somebody restores them because they will condemn themselves. Accusing others of deception if they're not transparent about their faults. So they are so focused. Some of you are oriented this way. This is so you are. Thank God for it. Be, be aware of these misuses as well. Okay, let's look at the, I think... I'm having a hard time finding the way to use this. Okay, there we are. Gifts of the characteristics of the server. The desire to sense sincere appreciation and ability to detect insincerity. These aren't people looking for credit. They're not even looking for, you know, for applause necessarily. But they do so much. And they're so easy to take for granted because so much of what they do is behind the scenes. And so they just want to be appreciated. We all want to be appreciated. But they can detect insincerity. They have a desire to give unexpected extra service. They, they like to go beyond what's expected. They, they're not people pleasers, but they like to please people. You know what I mean? They, 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 they just get joy out of seeing other people have satisfaction in what they do. They have an involvement in a variety of activities and a reluctance to say no. They have a hard time saying no. Here's why. They like to be trusted. We all like to be trusted. But servers, you know, when, if you come and bring a task to a server, they're going to say yes. Whether they've ever done it or not, they assume they can do it. And they probably can. They're very competent people often. And so they're not going to often say no, and some of the time they should. They have a great enjoyment with short-range goals and frustration over long-range goals. They like to get stuff done and tick it off and tick it off and tick it off. They don't like long, drawn-out projects, unlike a manager. And they have frustration when limitations of time are attached to jobs. Why? Because when they're in the midst of doing a job, somebody else gives them another job, and then somebody else gives them another job. And so they aren't always really happy when they're given deadlines. They have the ability to recall specific likes and dislikes of people. My mother was a server. And she could, she, I mean, I have a bad memory. I always say, of, of all the things I've lost, I miss my memory the most. So, uh, but she had a great memory. She could remember people's favorite colors. She could remember the names of their dogs, the birthdays of their kids. She had just, a, she, because those details meant a lot to her because she, she wanted to, to connect with people that way. They have an alertness to detect and meet practical needs. They could come into a, a meeting and they'll look around in the room and they'll see, oh man, that room's all scuffed up, that needs to be painted. The rest of us are sitting there not even aware of that. 
or there's an outlet that needs to be fixed, or these floors haven't been swept in a while. They are so uh, alert to facility needs, to practical needs. They especially enjoy manual projects. They're good with their hands. They like to fix things. They like, like to keep busy with their hands. They have a motivation to meet needs as quickly as possible. And they have physical stamina with fulfilling needs with disregard for weariness. They're the ever-ready energizer bunny. They just keep going and going and going. They have a lot of energy. And they have a willingness to use personal funds to avoid delays. There was a church board meeting some time ago. And uh, the church board had a lot of very successful businessmen and businesswomen on it who made big decisions all week long. But it seems like it often happens when they come to the church, they put their brains on the hat rack and then go in because it's like they aren't even using their gifts. So they're in this board meeting and the printer broke down. And so I don't know what the printers cost here, but in America, they're pretty cheap, $100, $120, something like that. And so for half hour, all these high-powered business people are arguing about which printer to get, which printer to get, which printer to get. And finally, this one guy speaks up and he says, I make a motion that we move on to the next agenda item. And somebody said, wait a minute, we haven't decided what printer we're going to get. And he said, yes, we have. I went online and I bought it. Now let's move on. <laughs> Avoiding <laughs> moving on, using personal funds to avoid the delay. He was a server. Misuse of the gift of serving. Neglecting home responsibilities to serve others. Um, accepting too many jobs at one time. Servers are apt to do that. Weariness, wearing themselves out physically. They have a lot of energy, but they can overdo it. Being too persistent in giving unrequested help to others and excluding others from helping on a job. They basically like to work alone. Doesn't mean they have to, but they're not all that eager to delegate. If they've been given a job, they want to get it done. And they have confidence that they can do it. They're not sure whether you can or not. <laughs> so so uh, they're not always really inviting of help. Um, uh, going around proper authorities in order to get jobs done, like maybe the guy at the board meeting, <laughs> um, can be a problem. Interfering with God's discipline with premature help. Sometimes God allows situations to exist to mature us as, as a church. But sometimes servers jump in ahead of time um, and interfere with God's purposes. Becoming hurt by ungratefulness of those being helped. And again, this is in the immature server. And getting sidetracked while working on an assignment. Um, again, they're working on a project and others bring things to them and they can get easily sidetracked. So these are misuses of the gift of serving. Maybe, I'm sure there are some here who are servers. Many pastors have this gift. They want to serve the body of Christ. They want to serve Christ. And so this is um, a common gift among pastors. Teachers, characteristics. Their belief that their gift is foundational to the others. They believe that because they uh, dig in and drill in on, on scripture and and doctrine that, that that is basic to everything else, foundational. They believe that. They have an emphasis on the accuracy of words. Words come together to form ideas, and ideas come together to form plans, and plans come together to, to, to uh, develop into destinies. So words are imp important. And so um, they emphasize the accuracy of words. They test the knowledge of those who teach them. They're not going to quickly assume that somebody's teaching something, they must be right. They're like the Bereans, and I encourage all of us to be like the Bereans, and some of you already are doing that, and I love it. Going into the Word, is this really square with God's Word? And so they do that. They like research to validate the truth. They want to go right to the original source. And this is why I want to say um, commentaries can be good, but be careful just last Sunday, I was in a church service where a pastor who I dearly love, who doesn't have much training at all, preached on a psalm. And the whole time, he was talking about David's experience that was expressed through that psalm. Well, it wasn't one of the psalms of David. 
He didn't know that the whole time because he had used a, tra a commentary. I know where it came from. He used a commentary where the commentator said this was a psalm of David. It clearly is not one of the psalms of David. It was one of the, the post-exile psalms written probably 500 years after David. Well, that's not a grievous, that's not a sin, but it was a little misguiding to people who, who knew that. So um, not everybody likes to do research and not all commentaries necessarily are written by people who have done the research. Some of them are devotional, and that's great. Use them, but understand their role. Validating new information by dependence on established systems of truth. You know, and this is where I feel a little bit out on a limb because some of you are thinking, well, this is new. Well, it's new to you, but I can take you back to the Vulgate, the Latin translations and other translations where they make very clear distinctions between these terms that unfortunately, the King James translators did not do, and many who've come after them did not do. So, uh, established systems of truth. For me, the established system of truth is what Paul wrote, what the Holy Spirit inspired, and what those words mean. Um, they avoid illustrations from non-biblical sources. When they're speaking or preaching, if they're preaching from the New Testament, they probably use illustration from the Old Testament and vice versa. They kind of are glued to the text more than others, perhaps. They resist scriptural illustrations out of context. They get, like I was just talking about the pastor, it wasn't an illustration, it was a whole sermon that was based on a wrong premise. They have greater joy in researching truth than in presenting it. They would rather spend an hour studying maybe than an hour teaching because they just enjoy learning. And they present truth in a systematic sequence. They're orderly in the way they present truth. And they have a proper a concern for proper use of scripture contextually. Misuses of this gift, becoming proud of their knowledge. First Corinthians, I think nine says, or eight or nine says, knowledge puffs up, but love edifies or builds up. Can be, in fact, all of the gifts can have a little problem with pride if they don't understand it's a gift from God. Despising practical wisdom of less educated people. Sometimes people are very wise beyond their education. Communicating skepticism toward their teachers rather than being willing to listen and then research and, and dig deeper. And criticizing sound teaching because of technical flaws um, that might not be related to the, what's being taught all, at all. Um, I don't know why I'm not, okay. Uh, other misuses, depending on human reasoning rather than the Holy Spirit's teaching. This can be a problem to a teacher where they think, oh, it's all, I can figure it out. And, and sometimes, we, often we can't. We need the Holy Spirit's instruction to help us get a better understanding. Or giving information that lacks practical application. How can I use this? And maybe some of you are thinking that right now. How can I use this? Well, when you discover your gift, and I hope that will happen, um, you're going to see it clearly. I've seen this often, very often. And I want to say this too. When I meet with groups, and sometimes I've taught this to as few as six people and sometimes to hundreds of people, but I always like to do a diagnostic, several diagnostics. And this may make you uncomfortable. I don't know your culture that well, but I always like to get people to begin to make some decisions, to declare themselves a bit and say, yes, I have the gift. I believe I have the gift of, or I've narrowed it down to these two, or get people to, to make some kind of a declaration about it. And here's where sometimes Christians will say, well, I don't want to do that because that'll sound pri proud and prideful. Well, then you don't understand what a gift is. When you gi give, when you, when you receive a gift, let's say at Christmas, somebody gives you a gift, do you feel proud of that, that I, I have this gift? No. It's a gift that's been given to you. You don't feel proud about something that somebody else gave you. Same with a spiritual gift. You don't be proud that you have the gift of mercy or you have the gift of, of managing or whatever. It's been a given. So you should be f free to share it with others and, and don't feel like you're being proud about it. Um, other possible misuses, boring listeners with details of research and retreating into their own world of books. Teachers love books. And uh, I know I have a friend who's got 36,000 books in his own personal library. 
And uh, his wife loves it because that means he doesn't, he's not going to be moving very often. <laughs> but, but they can be overly proud of their, their library and their books. So, um, Pastor, is, uh, it's a little after 12. Do you want to stop now and come back to this uh, tomorrow? Or what's, what's the plan that you... It was, do you want us to stop now? At, it's a little after 12. We've gone through the, the care... Hmm? Keep going. Okay. Take, all right. So we've gone through. Let me ask this question first. I'll ask the first question. How many of you from just these three, we've looked at characteristics and misuses, think that you might be, your gift might be prophets or server or teacher. You might be one of these. Okay. It's not a lot. Okay. All right, so we'll keep going and we'll unpack more of them and we'll see what the others uh, might, might suggest to you. Okay, so what's, what's the plan now then? Okay. okay, so questions so far. Yes. nine gifts of the spirit but from what you have taught us today we've seen that we have seven spiritual gifts i want you to differentiate between the spiritual gifts and our basic natural endowments my second question is can one person have two or more ministries or callings then my last question is can a believer operate two or more manifestations good questions excellent good all right hope i can remember let me start with the last one yes a believer can manifest any of those all of them as the holy spirit distributes and and i have a friend who was in a bible study with me and he said in his lifetime of ministry he had uh, exercised all all nine in first corinthians 12 of the manifestations uh, ministries and callings, yes. Um, wait, your question there was? Can one person have two or more ministries or calling? Yes. Okay, so I'm going to go, so this is going to be hypothetical. Don't take this one to the bank. But I think in that list of Ephesians, I think it's almost steps. I think, I think apostles have been prophets who have been before that evangelists and pastors and teachers. I kind of think there's a growth in that regard. So I think, yes, an apostle can also function as a prophet or an evangelist or pastor and teacher. And the other question was? And your basic, okay. So we all have basic talents. Some things come kind of natural to us, and some things we learn. But, but people in the world have those as well. Let's say music, okay, is an area. You, there's some great musicians who don't have the Holy Spirit. So it's a natural ability. But guess what? Their music doesn't minister to my soul. When a person is uh, ministering through the Holy Spirit, that ministers to my soul. And so there's a difference. But sometimes your natural abilities can be used. But again, it's not your gift. Your gift is a motivation. But as a ministry, yeah, all, all of those things can happen. Um, teachers can be good teachers. <laughs> they aren't all good teachers. Um, I had a situation at Pillar College where I was teaching this to our faculty. And we walked through this. And so, But I, I kind of set them up for this. I said, okay, they were standing in front of me. So tell me what you teach. And this one, I, I teach mathematics. You know, I teach uh, chemistry. I teach literature. I teach history. And I got to this one teacher. She's been with us for a long time. She was a great teacher. I said, and, and what do you teach? She said, I teach students. Big difference. The others are all focused on their discipline. She's focused on their students. Did you have Beverly Bush? You had her. So she was concerned more about you than about literature. Do you see? 
her gift wasn't teaching, her gift was mercy. And I kind of think that often the best teachers are people who have the gift of mercy because they're focused on their students. Whereas teachers may be more on their material. Just an illustration. Another question? And please, I want to know the difference between a gift and an office, if such a thing exists. For instance, the gift of prophecy and the office of a prophet. And then my second question too is um, how to combine, I mean, when a person discovers his or her gift, how to um, behave in a local church. For instance, if you discover that you are a prophet or a server, I mean, if someone calls himself a server, it's normal. I mean, people would not really have a problem with it. But if you're in a local church and you discover your gift as a prophet and you start calling yourself a prophet, it <laughs> raises a lot of um, attention. And then if you don't take care, you will be expelled because you call yourself a prophet. So I want to know. Um, <laughs> That's a great question. I think I know where you're going. Let me see if I answer your question. So the first one is distinguish between the office and, and the calling. So uh, or the office and the ministry. The office is a calling from the church. You know, no one takes it unto themselves to be an apostle or to be a prophet in the, in the church. You may have a spiritual gift of prophecy, but not be called to, to an office in the church. And you will in your churches probably have, you know, several people who have, who are oriented, who their motivational gift is prophet, but they're not going to be uh, a pastor or, or a, a deacon or something that way. So it's a difference between the calling of the church and the inward motivation as a spiritual gift. Let me see if I answer the second question. The reason I think that God has given these sevenfold gifts to the church is because we have many different kinds of needs in the church. And ideally, a church will have identified leaders with different gifts. And so, when they understand their gifting and, and the gifting of one another, they can deploy themselves or be deployed most effectively according to the needs of the people. And so, yeah, maybe the person who's needing counseling doesn't go to the prophet, maybe one time. And then if a person's a prophet, they may say, you know, this is what I believe the word of God says, but I think you probably should go to an exhorter for some counseling or somebody with the gift of mercy who are more process oriented. The prophet wants instant change right then and there permanent. Whereas some of the, like an exhorter, it's, it's like the Holy Spirit. He'll take you through growth stages and continue to guide you into all truth. So, I don't know if that touches your second question. Does that, did I respond to, okay, good. So ideally, again, identifying in the church, first of all, please identify your pastor's gift. If you're the pastor, you need to know your gift. Yeah, I've, I've done church um, consulting for a long time. And one of the first things I do is say, okay, tell me your job description. So I get a flip chart out. And they start telling me all the things that are expected of them. You know, and it can go pages and pages. So if you don't have a written job description, that's what the people expect of you. You're not Superman or Supergirl. You can't do it all. And so you're going to be disappointing people. They won't say anything to you, but you might not be a good manager of things, and yet they expect you to be. I, this is a true illustration. My wife and I went and, and led a, a, a pastor's and elder's retreat a couple years, maybe about 10 years ago now. Elders and wives. They didn't have women elders in that church. They had about 10 elders, and, and a couple of them were pastors. We did the retreat. I hadn't taught this material for about five years, but I felt the Lord leading me to teach this. So I did. And so we went through it all. They all discovered their gift. Every one of them discovered their gift. And it was a good time. So I was going back to the, the host 
who was taking, who, uh, we were staying with, who was the head elder, and, and, and he said to me, Dr. Schroeder, you have no idea what just happened. And I said, no, I guess I don't, do I? What happened? He said, um, our pastor is a great preacher. He's known throughout the area. People come to our church. Our church is growing. He's a great preacher. And his wife is a wonderful children's worker. The parents and the kids love her. But we're about ready to fire him. If things don't change, we're firing our pastor. I said, why? He said, he's a terrible administrator. Things in the church are a mess. We don't have a calendar. Our finances are out of order. It's just administratively, it's a mess. So I said to him, John, you have 10 of you there. Four of your elders, four of them, identified themselves of having the gift of management. And you're going to fire your gifted pastor because they're not doing their job? He said, oh, I see what you mean. <laughs> so that's where that conversation ended. Several years later, I saw the pastor at a church conference. I hadn't heard anything. I said, so where are you now? He said, oh, I'm still at such and such a church. I said, really? How's it going? He said, it's going fantastic. He said, they're doing the ministry. All I need to do is to pray and to study and to preach. That's my job. Bingo! And now you've got church members who are doing their job. Because you see what Ephesians 4 says is he's given to the church apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers to do what? To equip the saints to do the work of ministry. But you and I have been, and I've been in a church like this where the idea was we pay you, you do the ministry. And so the ministry doesn't happen like it should. They're not fulfilled using their spiritual gift. People are being disappointed because they're not functioning as the church. Every person in the church is to be a minister. They're not all pastors, but they're all to be ministering. Someone said it this way, the church has two kinds of pillars. The pillars that hold it up and the caterpillars that crawl in and out. <laughs> and we don't need any caterpillars. We need pillars in the church. The members are supposed to do the ministry in the church and out of the church. But if you're not deployed that way, if your people don't know they have a spiritual gift, if they don't know what their spiritual gift is, if they don't know what their pastor's spiritual gifts are, several pastors, different spiritual gifts, the church isn't going to function well. I'm going to show you uh, in the next meeting, we, I think it's tomorrow, some, uh, some other slides that will demonstrate this idea. But such an important thing. This is, that's why so often the church doesn't function well because, you know, they've kind of either put the, they have misunderstanding of spiritual gifts and they lump everything together and they expect everything to be done by the paid pastors um, or um, they, they're not encouraged to be involved in ministry. So I really would like to see you unleash the laity. Unleash the laity. They're gifted. Help them discover their gift. Help them be delegated into areas where their gift can be used. If they're a manager, bring them in to help you with strategic planning and, and deployment of the people. If they're an exhorter, help them to do Bible studies and, and disciple-making ministry, disciple ministries. If they're a server, give them practical things to do for the facilities and, 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 and projects and technology and so on. If they're a prophet, give them chances to proclaim God's word. If they're a teacher, learn from them, help other people go into the depths of the word of God. If they're mercy, help them to become the, the, the grief-sharing people and so on. And, and so on with all of those gifts. You've got tremendous resources in the people of your church who can be unleashed into ministries and bless the church and grow the church. Thank you for a good session today. God bless you. Let's stand.